Thank you very much. Uh, that was a very powerful uh, address by Jacinta, and I feel um, it kind of re-energized all of us to fight for what is right. Um, and uh, so it's an absolute honor for me to be present here and be able to exchange my thoughts and ideas with all of you. Um, and I am, I was thinking when Jacinta was um, explaining her life journey and through which she was also trying to tell us the invisible communities in India, which are totally off the map for most of the supposedly mainstream media, as we like to call it. Um, I usually say that they are not mainstream because they invisibilized and effectively have invisibilized in the last one decade, 85 or 90% of India's population, uh, which is all of Dalits, all of tribals, all of you know minorities, laborers, farmers, um, India's poor. And I, I'm even going to the extent of saying that they have even inv invisibilized our youth. So uh, a media which does not take into account the issues and subjects of people of more than 85%, 90% of India, they still you know, get to be called uh, mainstream media. Uh, and then Jacinta was talking to us, I was thinking about um, how she has so uh, effectively and perfectly used social media for this invisible community. But at the same time, um, I was thinking about 200 million Muslims who have been watching, uh, you know, live lynchings, their demonization, vilification, uh, you know, uh, villainization of themselves and their communities every day on social media. Uh, so uh, in the next few minutes, I'm going to talk about how two major communities, marginalized communities, uh, you know, Muslims and farmers, how they use social media, uh, perhaps for their advantage, but at the same time, uh, whenever I think of uh, this whole majoritarian wave and how much of it is we get to see online um, may not be, uh, you know, perfect good news for the 200 million Muslims who actually kind of seeing this whole genocide announcements, this whole, uh, you know, genocide journalism, this whole activism, this whole, uh, you know, movement, that majoritarian movement that's going on in India right now live on their social media feeds. So I think that's for another day. Today, I thought to discuss not uh, my story, but stories of people who I cover every day. And I feel despite uh, the supposed, uh, you know, uh, mainstream media invisibilizing major communities, um, invisibilizing especially the marginalized communities, how in India, under Narendra Modi, when the, the majority of the media is pliant, they have surrendered themselves, they have become literally a propaganda, uh, you know, kind of arm of the current government. We could still have two major mass movements. One was anti-CA NRC movement, which was led by uh, Muslim women, one of the most marginalized communities in India, and how it changed narrative around Muslim women. Another uh, movement that I covered was um, the movement by farmers against the three farm laws. Again, this was not just about, you know, their livelihoods. It was also about their lives. So um, I, I heard, I overheard some of the conversation of the last session, whether journalists should be activists or not. And, you know, kind of, I was thinking about Jacinta and I was thinking about all these communities, whether they, they get to be in, in Indian, they get to be a human, you know, all these, uh, you know, lines have been blurred long ago. And before I start, um, we should also remember that India, uh, even in 2022, became, it, it topped the chart, it became the Vishwaguru, the world leader in shutting down internet for the fifth consecutive year. So there couldn't be a better platform than this to say it's so shameful for a government to ban access to information, to internet, through which India's most marginalized are actually getting to have a voice, whatever, even if it's feeble, even if it's a weak voice, even if it becomes an echo chamber, at least they get to have some voice. So India becomes yet another fifth consecutive year. India uh, has blocked internet out of 187 internet shutdowns, 84 have been conducted by Indian government. Right, so before we, before I actually kind of 
try to do this layout on how these two major communities used uh, the internet or the social media to their advantage, or if it's a mixed story, uh, may not be advantage all the time. We must understand that how this whole mainstream media is mirroring and has mirrored actually this whole uh, you know idea of how the government wants to portray India like a typically strictly I would say a sanitized image of India where everybody all the communities all religions regions you know uh, linguistics linguistic communities they are all in unison with the current government, with the current prime minister's vision of India, the politics and policies that he advocates and his government advocate. Um, and then, you know, how this one leader and one political party is taking India on the path of progress. This is a very, and even if they, if they stopped until here, this would have still been fine that they were just trying to kind of, you know, be pliant. But what they did effectively in the last 10 years, and this was impossible. So unless you suppress the voice of the people who deserve a voice, the voice which have a, a, a differentiating point of view, a voice of dissent, you cannot actually, without suppressing, you cannot amplify a certain narrative, a narrative that the government of India wants to project. So what they did effectively was, while projecting this very sanitized and, and central image of uh, you know, um, this current government and the current prime minister, they also effectively suppressed all these voices. They villainized them. They demonized them. And I feel that, you know, about, till about 20, uh, 2020, this was enough for at least the Muslims of India that they decided to get up. They decided to take control of their own destiny. So I feel these, the success of these two major mass movements is also people getting tired and frustrated of being invisibilized, of being demonized, of being villainized, of being thrown to the margins of Indian democracy and the whole media landscape, that they now took control of their own destiny. This is how I see they try to use social media uh, to their advantage. So um, now first example would be uh, how I saw Shaheen Bab, um as it, it is popularly known as, or, uh, you know, the protest against CA and NRC. So when I started covering Shaheen Bagh movement, um, this whole uh, movement started not when women actually uh, formally started protesting. It started when the students at the Jami Milia Islamia were brutally beaten up by Delhi police. And so some of the stories which went on uh, Instagram, Twitter, and even on Facebook was actually the initial trigger for people to first gather at the police headquarter, Delhi police headquarter in New Delhi. So when a few dozen people, they decided to gather because they were so outraged, they were so angry, they were so hurt that they decided to gather at, you know, the Delhi police headquarter in New Delhi. And within a few hours of that, the mothers of those children, initially, the mothers of those children who were beaten up, they sat down at Shaheen Bagh, and there were just about a few dozen women. When I went to Shaheen Bagh, <clears throat> I met a family. I met a woman, a, a middle-aged woman called Yasmin. Yasmin looked that she came from, looked like any any other you know Indian woman who is from an upper middle-class family. And she had come with uh, two of her daughters. Both of them were studying in Delhi University. Um, very smart, English-speaking, uh, techno-savvy women. So those were not essentially women I would have thought maybe that they were there for their own rights because they had sufficient documents to prove their nationality, sufficient documents to prove that they were Indians. They told me that they were there to show solidarity with people who may not be able to have documents. They were there to show solidarity with women and men and people in general who will not be able to produce documents. And these three people, Yasmin and two of her daughters, 
families like this they became part of the movement so they would come to shahin bagh every day they would go back home would tweet about it and this was for the first time when yasmin's daughter daughters both of them they decided to have a twitter account so one after the other one family after the other there were first dozens and then hundreds and then there were thousands of young and old muslim women who suddenly arrived on social media and i feel by the end of the 100, 100 days this whole movement went on for about 100 days at the end of the movement i feel this was the arrival of muslim women on not just the political but also the social media scene of india so this whole thing that how should people be activists should journalists be activists should should doctors be activists should comedians be activists right this whole line is in a way is kind of defined by the circumstances that we face and when i think of families like yasmin i just used it as an example to tell you that there were people who were there for themselves but there were people who were there for their neighbors for you know their friends for their helps like people like me would go there to show solidarity with people who work for me like who are my lifeline i am here right now standing in front of you speaking because there are people who are taking care of my home and my family at home they are my lifeline so i will go there even as a journalist i would say i would go there as a citizen of india to show solidarity for the my domestic helps to show solidarity for my driver to show solidarity for my gardener to the the private security guard who guard my society while i sleep peacefully so yasmin's was one of those families which i feel uh were behind those twitter storms that you you saw like before that they maybe they had no idea how they thought maybe twitter was for politicians twitter was for politics twitter was for pe- people who were activist twitter was for people who um who had a political opinion but how circumstances and these utterly majoritarian policies and politics of the current government forced people to come on social media to do activism for their survival for their existence for their rights for their freedom so this is one such example that how this whole you know movement also spread nationwide because of social media like let's say for example let's imagine a scenario when there was no twitter no instagram no facebook and there was still shahin bagh movement i am not saying that there wouldn't have been a shahin bagh movement but maybe it would have just been limited to 100 200 or 500 women sitting in shahin bagh locally and you know sloganeering and saying that we want our rights back it wouldn't have really spread it to at least more than 100 cities in india and this became the first movement that you know women who were one of the most marginalized section of india especially in the post 2014 scenario which challenged muslim women challenging narendra modi when he was at his strongest best or strongest worst i leave it to you to decide they challenged the most margin, marginalized community challenged narendra modi india's prime minister when he was at his strongest he got reelected in the same year remember 2019 he got reelected he won more seats than he did in 2014 and this whole pet project of bjp and rss which says that demonize muslim men and patronize muslim women the narendra modi was supposed to be the savior of muslim women who brought in you know law against triple talaq and he was supposed to be saving muslim women but you saw that how when they challenged narendra modi and this whole narrative of muslim women not being victims uh, but challengers but taking control of their own destiny we saw on twitter how muslim women were demonized there was an online auction even in this small gathering there are more than two muslim women sitting including myself who were put on online auction that we were we were available for sale so this is what happens when you try to disturb the whole you know uh, this propagated you know narrative that they try to put forward so after this demonization of muslim women uh, women came the farmers protest i would just take two more minutes 
and also will tell you that how people like me were also branded as chief strategist of Shaheen Bagh, just because I was one of those leading people, leading journalists who were covering the protests. So when they try and also take away credibility of journalists, like if I am the chief strat strategist of Shaheen Bagh, how am I still supposed to be a reporter covering Shaheen Bagh? So if you call me, you know, somebody who's strategizing and is, is that anti-national person who is the brain behind this whole mass movement. I mean, I'm sure they think of me more powerful than I actually am. Um, but at the same time, you know, by doing this, they, what they want to do is that they want to take away uh, and reduce the impact of my work. When they attack my identity, when they attack my journalism, it's objectivity. And quickly, I would like to tell you also about what happened in during farmers' movement. And also, I don't know whether you find it funny or ironical that how these two major mass movements were spearheaded by two minority communities. I'm sure there were other like-minded and democratic-minded people who came and joined hands with them. But initially, they were started by Muslims and Sikhs of India. The farmer, farmers' movement was started by the Sikhs. NTC and RC movement was started and the mass, I would say the critical mass were also Sikhs and Muslims. And whatever you, you want, you can make of it. And suddenly now, Sikhs, which was supposed to be part of this larger Hindu family, uh, they, they become Khalistanis. They become people who, um, you know, are selling themselves and their souls for a few hundred rupees. They are then suddenly, uh, you know, patronized and funded by the ISI, by Pakistan. They are the people who become separatist. And, you know, the people who are calling these people separatist and Khalistanis are actually the biggest advocates of a Hindu Rashtra. So if asking for a separate state, you know, of Khalistan is separatism, what exactly is asking for a separate nation or turning India into a Hindu Rashtra? Like it, it's it's beyond me to even understand that asking to turn a country under one religion name should not be called separatism or anti-national or seditious. But another, you know, set of people, if they are trying to say something, then that becomes seditious. So how farmers who were supposed to be, you know, sons of the soil, this was the last thing we ever thought that even farmers will be branded as anti-nationals. So farmers, all of a sudden, who were just kind of keeping themselves, which usually they are, to just farming, they suddenly started kind of popping up on social media. Now you see a lots of lots of handles uh, under the name of Kisan and you know farmers leaders. There were young men and women. There was a whole newspaper that was kind of uh, published during the whole farmers more than a year long farmers movement. So I would say it's a mixed story for India's most marginalized that they they could at some point use it to their advantage at the same time the worst hatred the worst pushback the worst kind of vilification also was faced by them on this very social media platform but i would still say social media internet if they allow us and do not really continue to do the shutdowns that they do um, is good news for the marginalized communities uh, of the largest democracy of the world thank you very much